And of course, cycling keeps you fit and healthy. Innovations in healthcare. So um, in um, healthcare, we looked at frailty care. Uh, people who are less able to look after themselves, what can we do to keep them independent at home and um, prevent them having to go into hospital? And we put together a team and uh, involved social and um, healthcare, which was quite innovative at the time. This was probably uh, 10 years ago now. Uh, we've had permission, by the way, for all these photos or their um, bought photos so that you know that we've had that. Um, the frailty clinic that we set up in the surgery has now led on to a frailty service led by a consultant and a paramedic and a nurse. And they um, are helping us to look after people who are struggling at home. We also have a transformation team which has been put in place, which helps with the chronic social care. So there's quite a team now that's evolved from that single GP. On the next slide, you'll see that we became involved with counselling. And uh, at the moment with COVID, that's quite an important issue. You'll see on the next slide the posters that we produced and took nationally about the counselling service. And this service is unique because it helps support the local colleges who are training counsellors. And they come to us for their 100 hours training in their last year. Um, and in so doing, they contribute to the service and help our patients. We have a coordinator, in this case, Ken Lawrence, who helps organise things. And previously, it was Christine Dunkley who founded it. And we have a supervisor who meets with them once a month to help develop their skills. And this has become a, a national model. It's been on the uh, National Institute of Clinical Excellence website and has been recognized at conference presentations. The next one will show the London Olympics. Now I'm very lucky <laughs> to have been at the London Olympics, have, as have many people like Debbie in the audience. And um, it's been really good uh, to be involved with that. You can see a picture here of the Smurf turf. Um, the pink and blue, they called it Smurf because of the colours. And this is the hockey pitch. Um, and the hockey pitch is actually a waterlogged synthetic pitch. And it's waterlogged to actually make the hockey ball travel faster. 100 miles an hour, roughly. Um, and hockey is one of those situations where you get lots of injuries. Um, almost every game, I was having to go on and help with the, the team to pick up someone who'd been injured, often with the hockey stick, uh, but sometimes with falls. And you can just about make me out there with a sort of green bag on the back and wearing one of the caps. Um, we had a lot of training, but the training was mostly about how to carry a stretcher onto and off the pitch without making an idiot of yourself. Because it's very easy, and my kids showed me clips of how you can pick up a stretcher and the head of the patient goes between your legs, or you can run into the patient and slide and hit them with your feet. None of that happened, I'm pleased to say, so we got away with it. This gentleman had a, a dislocated shoulder, and we have a team here uh, around of an orthopedic surgeon, an A&E consultant, a nurse, a physiotherapist, and a GP. You can imagine there's a lot of discussion about how you do things, and uh, one of the ways you can really uh, replace a shoulder that's been dislocated is putting your foot into the armpit and pulling. I've done that in the past. Or you can manipulate the arm like this. Or you can just ask the patient to lie on their front and hold a weight and the socket and the shoulder joint goes back into the socket. So after much discussion, that's what we did. And he was fine afterwards and very keen to get back on the pitch. They're amazingly brave hockey players. I've had the captain who fractured her jaw, went back on and played two days later with a plate in place. Um, and when we were stitching people up, they were saying, please, quick, 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 we want to get back on the pitch. Yeah, so it's amazing, really good team. And it was a great experience, wasn't it? Yeah. So um, next slide. This led on to the community games and um, uh, people here have been involved with this on, on an annual basis. And the aim was to promote um, uh, physical activity uh, and the surgery and the PPG um, uh, contributed people to these games and uh, we helped with the first aid stand in particular with our uh, nurses uh, and, and team members. At the same time, we also were involved with the uh, St. Francis uh, Cafe, which helps support people. 
there was the health walks prescription scheme there was the arts prescription scheme which is still going thanks to a local gp peter white and there was a books on prescription health books this was so there's lots of innovation happening at the time and on the next slide i want to move on to the consultations themselves now we have seven minutes face to face for a consultation now it's a 10 minute appointment slot when i started 1991, we had five minute appointments and seven minute appointments. Now the national average is about 12 minutes. It depends on which area you're in, nine to 12 minutes. We have possibly a minute or so at the start to look at the records and see what's happened in the past and work out what needs to be done today. At the end, we have another minute or so to uh, do the tests, do the investigation, write the referrals and write the notes. So you can see it's quite tight to get the consultation in place. And we want to listen. We want to have a gold minute of listening if we can. We want to examine. We want to help share the options. We want to help share the management. And those things about sharing the options and sharing the management are things that have come in over the last 20 years when you compare it to the 90, well, probably 1897, when it was very much the doctor said. Now it's very much a shared approach. On the next slide, you'll see that we looked at ways we could make the consultation more efficient. And there's the thing called ICE, ideas, concerns, and expectations. Now the consultation is a bit like an iceberg. People come in with the one thing, and actually there's a lot of other things they want to talk about or relate to it. They might come in with pain on the side, but actually there is um, more to it. It might be that the financial issues or relationship issues or home problems or work problems are aggravating that pain and making it go on much longer than we'd expect. So it's about finding out what's going on and finding out what your ideas are about your illness, what your concerns are about it, is it cancer or what, and what your expectations of how we handle it, scan or not, are very important. And in many cases, people don't want an antibiotic, they just want reassurance. Um, so it, it's something that's quite important to know. And in many cases also, people will know what the problem is and tell us, and it will be much more straightforward because we're all on the same page. Good thing to listen to people and they'll tell you. Next one shows that we then took this to conferences nationally. Overall, over the years, we've published about 40 papers. We've had about um, 30 presentations, about 20 posters at conferences in various sites. And this was an example of one where we talked, we had a hundred patients who had, um, uh, gone through the process of writing down before the consultation what their ideas, concerns and expectations were. And because they did that, that made the consultation easier. And the doctors were very pleased with it and patients were very pleased with it. Some of you may have completed them. It won a national award because it was quite innovative in, a, in approach. And um, now it's been superseded by eConsult, which I'm sure you've all been so excited to use. Uh, eConsult is going to be superseded. I'm hoping that those ideas, concerns and expectations will come back in more clearly and it'll be more simple and straightforward. On the next slide. And the next one. And we got stuck somehow. We'll come forward to 2019. 2019, just before COVID, we established the Chandler's Ford Primary Care Network. This is with Fry and Surgery, and is some 30,000 patients in total. Most organisations, and over the years, 30 years, I've seen so many reorganisations. It's just one of the things that government likes to do, I think. This is the first one that's actually had an impact at local level. And we have had additional roles funded for us. Um, we've had a social prescriber who looks at um, benefits for an individual, financial support, looks at how they can maintain their independence at home and supports the carers for them. We've had a first contact physiotherapist that you can book in directly to for your aches in your shoulder or back. That's Joe Jenkins. It's Julie Bithell, who's the social prescriber. And um, we have a pharmacy team now who are doing those thousands of prescriptions I mentioned. We are also having a mental health nurse who's going to be joining us, or in fact has already joined us in the last few weeks to help with the increased workload that's hit us with COVID. And 
we have uh, paramedics joining us to help with our visiting. So there's lots of new roles coming on board. The team's expanding. We have some 55 people now employed, as opposed to the one GP in the start. Some roles, however, have changed. And we used to have our um, health visitors, community nurses and midwives all in the surgery. Unfortunately, they've all been taken away and moved to more central resources. So benefits and disadvantages there. It's during this time that the surgery had a chance to talk, uh, or I was involved in Radio Solent, and we did a few talks on uh, teenage exam stresses, um, mental health. Uh, on here, you've got connect with others, be active, take notice, learn and give. They're tips about maintaining your mental health. Meet with other people, do physical activity, look at your environment, learn something new each day and give something, whether it's a smile, a chat um, or your time. Next one. A big thank you for the research. I've already mentioned that we're involved in it. Panoramic is the current research project. If you get COVID, you can get access to new COVID treatments and you can help our knowledge move forward about those treatments. The principal study has been a real success in the last two years on an international level, and we were involved with it. This looked at existing medications and we showed that antibiotics didn't help COVID. It showed that inhaled steroids used for asthma does help COVID infections and reduce complications. It showed that some of the treatments that President Trump took, it doesn't help. Hydroxychloroquine, no. Washing out with Dettol, no. That wasn't in the study. We have more recently looked at contraception devices and I've been involved with some papers looking at ways of um, uh, cutting the threads that come with contraceptive devices in the womb, at ways of providing analgesia beforehand uh, prior application. And we've been involved with continuity of care. Um, uh, I've led as part of a national project with five sites across England, looking at ways we can improve continuity for half a million patients. And the results have come out now and shown there is an improvement in continuity. And as a practice, we strive for it, although it might not seem like that at the moment with COVID and all that's happening. And thank you for your involvement with COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. If you've been involved with that, you've had additional inhalers and we've shown the benefits of those. So lots of research activity. And the next slide. So looking back 1990 to 2020, we have less emergencies. I get called out for less emergencies than I did when I started in practice. In practice, I would be seeing a heart attack or a stroke every week. I might be resuscitating somebody uh, every few weeks. That has not happened to me for several years now. And partly that's prevention, and partly that's because the ambulance service is responsive and we have rapid treatments. We can now dissolve clots that cause strokes and heart attacks. I couldn't do that um, when I started out. I used to look up after people at home um, if they had a heart attack or a stroke in many cases. The treatments, however, have become more complex and we're handling a lot of stuff that was handled in the hospital. In fact, most things are handled by us now. Um, the appointment numbers you'll find have increased and the duration has increased, but it might not seem like that because we're getting so much more work from the hospital. We now have out of hours support and we now have a, visit, a visiting service in place in response to COVID as much as anything else. And we've had an expansion of our practice team. I said 55 at the moment. Chronic disease has moved to us. We do all the asthma care and the diabetes care, for example, that all, all done in the hospital. And at the same time, the government has increased our targets. Anything they can measure, they'll set as the target. They've stepped back a little bit with COVID but there has still been that issue. And that tends to divert us from what we feel is the most important bit, which is discussing things and talking to the patient in front of us. Expectations have risen, not only amongst ourselves as patients, but ourselves as doctors. Uh, we want to do more and can do more and uh, patients expect more. Next slide. 